Catalina Island. Few airports are surrounded by as much mystique and myth as the airport here, 26 miles off the coast of Southern California. It's gained a reputation as being dangerous, but it's actually an incredible aviation destination, something that has to be experienced and well within the reach of most pilots. Hi, I'm Mark Lee, and today we're gonna to fly to Catalina's airport in the sky. We're gonna find out what makes that airport unique, what makes it challenging. We're gonna look at the mistakes that pilots make when they fly there, and hopefully teach you what you need to know to fly there safely. Now, while we could fly over in the Cirrus or this tail wheel behind me or any of the aircraft on this ramp, we're gonna up the fun factor by a whole, whole bunch. And we're gonna fly over to Catalina in this. This is my classic Great Lakes 2T1A2 biplane. Designed in 1929, it carries two people, it has a 180 horsepower engine, and absolutely no technology. It harkens back to what flying was like in the early days. If you've never been in an open cockpit biplane, you're missing out. This is the perfect ride for an afternoon flight to Catalina Island. Before we get started on our trip to Catalina, let's take a one minute look at this historic airport. Though Catalina's history goes far back, the airport's history began in 1919 when William Wrigley Jr. of the Chewing Gum Fortune bought the island with visions for its future. By the 1920s, Hollywood had discovered Catalina as a filming location and hundreds of classic silent era films were made there. When the movie stars came back to the island to relax, the tourists followed. Most people arrived by steamship, but the well-heeled came to Avalon by seaplane, preferring the 25-minute channel crossing to the steamship's two and a half hours, especially in rough seas. William Wrigley died in 1932, but his son Philip, who loved aviation, took over and decided to build an airport in the island's interior in 1939. Essentially a rugged mountain range sticking out of the ocean, Catalina has no flat land. So Wrigley's construction team blew the tops off two mountains and used the resulting 200,000 truckloads of dirt to fill in the gap. On top of that, they put a paved 3,200-foot runway and a terminal building. World War II delayed construction, but Buffalo Springs Airport, as it was originally called, was finished in 1946. United Airlines immediately started passenger service there in Douglas DC-3s. The airport was private, but Wrigley got so many requests from pilots to land there that he finally opened it up for public use in 1959. And it hasn't changed much since. Whether I fly this airplane or any other airplane to Catalina, the possibility of losing an engine and having to ditch in the ocean is always there. So now let's take a look at the equipment that you should have before making your Catalina crossing. The ocean between the mainland and Catalina is called the San Pedro Channel. These maps show what the bottom of the ocean looks like in the channel, which reaches depths of over half a mile. The water temperature in the channel is cold, averaging 60 degrees, which means hypothermia will set in quickly even in summer. Not to mention all the weird and unfriendly sea creatures that lurk beneath you. If you ditch, the idea is to get out and get out fast. So let's look at some essential gear you'll need to carry when you fly to Catalina. First essential device, a PLB or personal locator beacon. This particular device, if you have to ditch, you press a button on the side and it continuously transmits your location to search and rescue crews everywhere. It uses satellite signals so it works anywhere on the planet with a clear view of the sky. This one is Rescue Link by ACR. It's about $300. It's the best insurance money can buy and the difference between being found in maybe an hour versus possibly not being rescued at all. A life vest seems obvious in California. If you have to ditch into the water here, you're not going to be able to tread water for very long before your muscles cramp up. This particular one has a quick pull self-inflation tab. It inflates to a high visibility yellow color. It's small and compact and easy to wear. It's made by Mustang Survival and it's about $300. Chocks and tie down ropes. Catalina has neither. There are steel cables embedded into the dirt on Catalina but no ropes and there's nothing on the ramp so bring your own. Cell phone is a Ziploc bag. 
If you have to ditch into the water, this will keep your cell phone dry. I highly recommend a life raft. It's probably the, the most obvious ocean survival device. They're heavy, they're large, they're expensive, but they're worth every penny. And lastly, I wear a flight suit only in this airplane. This is flame retardant material, so it might buy me seconds or minutes and keep me alive. And there you have it, the essential list of equipment for your Catalina Crossing. Since 1983, there have been 52 accidents on or near Catalina, most of which could have been avoided with little information and preparation. So now let's get to the meat of it and discuss the challenges on Catalina and how we deal with them. The airport has a carrier-style runway, meaning it sits atop a mesa with steep drop-offs at both ends, like an aircraft carrier. Even on calm days, wind flows along the runway, then falls off at either end. These downdrafts cause sinking at the approach end of either runway, so you need to anticipate the sink on short final. No dragging it in. The problem is, pilots have heard about these downdrafts, and they think they're stronger than they are. So they come in too high and too hot, causing even bigger problems in the landing. Also, flying an approach over terrain that rapidly changes from mountains to oceans to mountains can be tricky for a lot of pilots, so use your altimeter. The runway at Catalina is bowed. It has a hump in the middle, and you land uphill on runway 22. This causes a number of problems and visual illusions. First, the uphill runway makes you think you're higher than you really are on the approach. Second, you can't see departing traffic on the opposite side of the runway and they can't see you, so calling your positions is critical. And third, the hump of the runway appears to be the end of the runway as a visual illusion. Inexperienced pilots that are worried about the cliff on the other end touch down, see the crest, and think the cliff is approaching. They smash on their brakes and either burn their nose wheel or collapse the gear. Sadly, a common cause of fatal accidents at Catalina is the short runway combined with high density altitude. On a hot summer day, the density altitude here could easily reach 5,000 feet or more. That results in a significant decrease in your aircraft's performance, a longer takeoff roll due to the less dense air, and dramatically decreased climb performance. Too many pilots come in the morning loaded with fuel and passengers, and then they leave during the hottest part of the day. They run out of runway with predictable results. Pre-study an airport diagram and use airport features as markers to determine how much runway you have left either for takeoff or landing. I like to use the runway turnoffs. Also on landing, if I'm not at normal speed and normal touchdown attitude between the windsock and the first turnoff, I'm going around. Catalina Airport, Avalon, California. Remarks. Density altitude 3,700. The runway surface is pretty rough. There are divots, holes, and loose rocks everywhere. The airport got a new slurry coat in 2012, but that's not the same as repaving. Once you touch down, don't just relax. Fly it all the way to the chocks. The taxiways are just as rough, so taxi slowly, especially if you have low prop clearance. There are no facilities on Catalina. That means no fuel or oil or mechanics or hangers or anything. If you break something, you have two choices. You either fly in your own mechanic tools and parts to fix it, or you dismantle the wings, truck the airplane down to Avalon, and have it ferried back across to San Pedro, a very expensive proposition. Before coming to Catalina, take on as much fuel as you can, accounting for the density, altitude, and temperature for that day, along with the performance of your airplane. Rather than hear me talk about the mistakes pilots make on Catalina, I'd rather you heard it from the source. 
George O'Leary is the manager there, and he agreed to talk to us about what he sees pilots doing wrong. He's the voice you hear every time you call Unicom for landing advisories. He made a list of what he sees pilots doing wrong and his suggestions for doing it right. Rather than paraphrase, we thought we'd use George's words directly. Well, at this point, we've looked at just about everything there is to look at when it comes to Catalina, from its history all the way to what makes it challenging and how we deal with it. Uh, flying time today to Catalina is going to be about 25 minutes or so. I've done an extra thorough pre-flight on the airplane, especially because we're going to be flying over so much water. I've topped the tanks off, so we've got a two-hour range plus a 45-minute reserve. I've called weather, and it's perfect. Uh, light winds, nothing adverse in the forecast. Now, I've chosen a, a VFR cruising altitude of 4,500 feet for our flight today. Some of you might say that's a little low. Well, this airplane has the glide ratio of a Coke machine. So for me to make it from the center of the channel to either shore, which is about 12 miles, I'd have to be at about 15,000 feet, which is pretty impractical, and it would destroy my passenger's ears on the descent. So when you choose a, a VFR cruising altitude, make sure you take into account your passenger's comfort on the descent, your airplane's uh, glide ratio, and safety and flotation equipment that you might have. Uh, at this point, what do you say we grab our gear, start her up, and let's fly to Catalina. If you learn nothing else from this video, heed my number one Catalina tip. Always get flight following. It gives you a voice you can contact immediately that's following your flight. In case of an emergency over all that ocean, you simply transmit a mayday and they'll have search and rescue crews dispatched before you hit the water. It's a second set of eyes. John Wayne Clearance, uh, Great Lake 6220 Lima, Executive Hangers with Kilo, requesting Mesa departure, VFR Catalina. Great Lake 6220 Lima, John Wayne Clearance on departure, turn right heading 220, maintain VFR out of below, 2400, advisory frequency with approach on 125.35, squawk 0252. Great Lakes 2, 0, Lee Murray, back to Creek, contact ground today. We've gotten clearance to taxi, we've done an extra careful run-up, and we've received clearance to taxi the runway for takeoff. Great Lakes 6, 2, 2, 0, Lee Murray, John right there. Hello, right turn approved, runway 2, 0, right, or 2, 0, left at Kilo, clear for takeoff. 2, 0, left at Kilo, clear for takeoff, early right turn approved, 2, 0, Lima. About one minute into the flight, the tower checks in to verify our altitude. Lima, 2 0 Lima, radar contact, maintain VFR below 2400 to altitude. 2 0 Lima, 600, maintain VFR out of below 2400. I confirm our altitude and restriction, and he hands us off to SoCal departure. Lima, 2 0 Lima, contact SoCal departure, see ya. Over to SoCal, 2 0 Lima, see ya. 
SoCal, good, uh, departure, good afternoon, Great Lake 6220 Lima, 1800, requesting 4500 to Catalina. Great Lake 6220 Lima, SoCal, first route requested, leaving 2000, resume navigation. Leaving 2000, resume on nav, 20 Lima. En route, there's plenty to do, and if you're not doing anything, then you must be flying wrong. You're monitoring your engine gauges and looking for anything abnormal. You're also looking out for traffic and you're looking out for boats in case you have to ditch, you ditch near them. But this is also the time to marvel at the beauty, the wonder, and the miracle of what we get to do as pilots. We're approaching the island now, about eight miles out. We just checked the automated Catalina weather, and SoCal hands us off to the local common advisory frequency on 122.7. Squad VFR, change advisory frequency approved. Squad VFR, we'll look for the traffic. Two zero Lima, good day. Let's look at how we enter the pattern on Catalina. The safest and preferred route is to point your airplane towards two harbors and descend to about 3,000 feet. Then turn east towards the airport and enter on the 45 downwind to right traffic runway 22 or left traffic runway 4. On a quiet day with no traffic, you can enter just east of the airport upwind making right traffic to runway 22. Straight in approaches are a bad idea at Catalina and are frowned upon by the airport. Today, we'll do a standard 45 degree entry for right traffic, runway 22. And Catalina traffic, 20 Lima is on the 45 right traffic, runway 22, Catalina 2600. We turn downwind, then base, then final, keeping everything in mind that we've learned on that final approach. I'm keeping a tight pattern and I've got my hand on the throttle. You'll notice I'm not doing anything crazy, it's just a normal approach and I'm using my altimeter for guidance. Everything is looking good. That's all there is to it. Welcome to Catalina Island. We'll find a spot on the ramp and shut her down. And don't forget to call clear of the runway. Catalina traffic, Great Lakes 20 Lima, clear runway 22, Catalina. Well, we've arrived safely on Catalina. All that's left to do is secure the plane and go into the office and pay our landing fee. The landing fee is currently $25, and if that sounds like a lot, you have to understand the airport isn't funded by the city or the county or the FAA. It depends on landing fees for its operation. You go up to the tower building to pay your fee. The best deal going is the Catalina Aero Club, which is $150, but gives you unlimited landings for a year, plus discounts on a lot of other stuff. There's so much to do on Catalina that it's the subject for a whole nother video. For now, make sure you go to the DC-3 Grill and have one of Catalina's famous buffalo burgers. If you have time, take the Wildlands Express down to Avalon, the center of what's happening on Catalina. It's a 30-minute ride down a windy road and well worth the trip. Flying to Catalina for your first time is definitely a rewarding aviation experience. If you're ready to do it, contact a flight school at one of the coastal airports here in Southern California. Get a thorough Catalina checkout from an instructor that's familiar with the island. I insist that all pilots get a thorough checkout before coming to Catalina for the first time. You'll be glad you did. When it's time to leave the island, you do everything you did to get here, 
only backwards. Make your first call on the ramp so incoming traffic will know which runway you're using since they can't see you. Taxi slowly and remember there's no run up area so you'll have to do a quick run up at the end of the runway. Make your departing radio call and start your takeoff roll. I waggle my wings and wave goodbye to my friends on Catalina until next time. You can do a right downwind departure from runway 22 or go straight out to the opposite shore, turn left and make a tour of the east end of the island. Also after departure, contact SoCal so you can request flight following back to your destination. They say once you've been to Catalina, it never leaves you, and certainly for pilots, that's the case. It's a magical place, and something every pilot should experience. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our look at Catalina Island in this awesome little airport. No matter how many times I fly there, I never get tired of it. Until our next adventure, I'm Mark Lee. And remember, as pilots, we never stop learning. Till next time, see ya.